Hello, everyone, and welcome to week eight or chapter eight of the semester. I'm Professor Rios. Hope you're doing well. Uh, this week is Europe. We move on to the European continent. Uh, so we'll begin with, of course, the Google Earth tour. So let me maximize this while we're at it and then zoom in a little bit. So we've been addressing Africa, first of all, Sub-Saharan Africa, South of the Sahara, North Africa and the Middle East. And now we're moving on to Europe. So the European continent, just looking at it from the perspective of Google Earth, um, let me go ahead and, yep, do not disturb, just to make sure. Uh, Google Earth is greener, right? So just by looking at that, with the exception of maybe Greece, the south of Italy, maybe Spain and Portugal, which is more of a Mediterranean climate like you would find on the north coast of Africa, or the Middle East like Lebanon and Syria and uh, Israel, uh, the climate in Europe is one that is in the sea range for the most part. So it's very pleasant. It doesn't get as cold in Europe as a function of the Gulf Stream coming in from the United States. So it bathes this area of the North Atlantic in warmer waters for where you would otherwise find latitudinally anyway, Europe, which is at the latitude of basically Canada for the most part. Um, it, involve, it includes, of course, what the countries you would expect, but it also includes former Soviet states like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, the Ukraine. So this region here forms essentially a, a wall. It's not the Warsaw Pact countries of the Cold War, obviously, they're not part of the Soviet Union. Uh, and it isn't really truly Europe yet. They're sort of in the middle still. That's still a thing. So this functions as a bridge. Um, also functioning as a bridge would be Turkey. Turkey is the bridge as discussed earlier between the Middle East, the Arabian Peninsula, what we call the Levant, uh, this whole Fertile Crescent region, Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, however you want to address it. Okay, you have very interesting places like Cyprus, which is interesting because it's still to this day sort of split between what's called the Green Wall. This is a more um, sort of split between Turkish Cyprus or Cypriots and also um, Greek. So it's an interesting island. It's uh, still torn ethnically, even to this day. Uh, of course, once you move away, you have areas of the European continent, for example, that have a lot of similarities. So for example, Portugal, Spain, the south of France, Italy. Um, the uh, peninsula here in Greece and the Greek Isles, more of Southern European, those sort of backgrounds are very similar. Um, of course, you have more Germanic influences in the Netherlands and Denmark, Belgium, uh, Austria, Switzerland, Germany. Uh, you have Czech and more Slavic backgrounds in the Eastern portion. You have what used to be the former Yugoslavia broken up into now different countries like Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Albania, Serbia, uh, North Macedonia. So this all used to be what was called once Yugoslavia. Uh, and so it has had its, its own share of rather um, problematic history. Um, then you have scan uh, of course you have the, sort of the epicenter of the industrial revolution the united kingdom made up of england wales scotland northern ireland and then of course you have ireland itself 
And then last but not least, of course, you have Scandinavian countries. So Finland, Sweden, Norway, and don't forget Iceland. So there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of difference. It is frankly one of the most interesting regions of the world. Chances are you have background from this area in your family. Even if you find, if, even if you call yourself Latin American, Hispanic, whatever the right term is nowadays to describe that. Uh, I myself have a history from uh, Northwestern Spain, specifically the area called Galicia. Uh, my mom's name, for example, is Lugo, which is the provincial capital of Galicia. This is where both my parents' families came from a long, long time ago when they basically migrated uh, to Puerto Rico. So even though my background is from Latin America, it is via this part of Spain. And even if your background has, you know, whether it's all white, part white, black, native, whatever the case might be, there is probably some component that hails from Europe. If you don't, then you don't. But chances are in the Northeastern United States, there's a lot of Italian, Irish, uh, English, German, Spanish influence. Of course, there are other influences as well. I'm just mentioning but a few. And if you think back to that um, set of uh, links about language, remember language as the gentleman in that video intimated is language is heritage, it's identity, it's uh, ethnicity. It's sort of tied to it in some way or another. All right. As a function of physical features, so we talked about how the Gulf Stream keeps this area relatively mild compared to what it would otherwise be based on latitude alone. You have Iceland, which sits basically cut in half by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It cuts right through here, and right now there's a volcano as of the making of this video a volcano somewhere in here that is basically uh, active and it makes sense it's right here along that divergent boundary and you can see it right there and if you really zoom out you can follow that boundary all the way to the south pole almost um uh, interesting, there's a lot of geopolitics here, um, lots of change taking place in Europe, as has been the case for centuries, obviously, but lots of changes happening right now politically. Uh, environmentally, this area of the world is probably one of the most environmentally conscious regions, and a lot of it has to do with their desire to be that, but a lot of it is also financially driven, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. Uh, so that's the um, Google Earth presentation. Uh, let me get rid of this. And let's get to the lesson itself. All right. So Europe, made up of many, many different places. Again, these are the objectives. Talk about the idea of topography, the climate of the area environmental issues, some of the key concepts and terms. This is the basic breakdown, went over it on Google Earth, but it's really 42 countries. There are big states like Germany, there are small ones like Andorra and Liechtenstein. Uh, it's relatively small and densely settled region, about 700 million people. And there is a shared history, but there's also a lot of cultural diversity, which is what I think makes Europe interesting. I think it's one of the things that makes Europe interesting to Americans. Just like what makes us unique, the US, makes us interesting to them. So it's sort of like a odd admiration or fascination depending on which side of the Atlantic you're from. Of course, this was the epicenter of the Cold War that divided the continent into sort of Eastern and Western uh, places. Obviously, that has since ended, uh, but there are other things that can lead to conflict 
beyond the Cold War um, construct. So again, there's the map in terms of like um, boundaries, plate boundaries. You have the North American plate and the Eurasian plate, and then I have the Eurasian plate and the African plate. So this down here in Italy, there are active volcanoes. There are active volcanoes, of course, in Iceland. And if you go way out east into what is um, Turkey, which is obviously a different region, but it's close enough to Europe for it to make a bit of a difference. So this, if you were to move Europe over the United States and Canada, that's where it would be. So Europe is it's big. It's not as big as the United States or Canada. Um, notice how here's the border of the United States. Notice how much of Europe would be north of the North American border between Canada and the US. Notice how far north Iceland would be at the latitude of Alaska. So would the majority of Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Even Italy, which is thought to be a mild Mediterranean climate, is roughly like the city of Rome is roughly at the latitude of St. Louis, Missouri, or New York City. So um, the big difference there, the big issue there is the fact that the warm Gulf Stream keeps them at a mild temperature. So I'm going to talk about this right here. Uh, of course, a, a remarkable diversity in ecosystems and biomes that are found from lowlands where lots of agriculture takes place to alpine mountain systems in places like Norway and Sweden. And there it is, that Gulf Stream we've been talking about. So these are ocean uh, currents. The red ones are warm. The cold ones are blue. No big surprise where you would find the cold ones, but generally speaking, cold currents are found in the eastern side of oceans. Warm currents are found on the western side of oceans because that water is coming from the equator. And a Gulf Stream or any current essentially functions as a moderating force. Uh, it's a way of taking excess heat from the equator and transporting it towards the north. That's the idea there. If you want to simplify it even more is essentially what the Earth, <coughs> excuse me, what the Earth does in order to relieve the imbalance that exists because the Earth is a tilted planet revolving about the sun. So different areas of the Earth are heated differently based on season, okay? Here is another way of looking at climate. So this is from the Earth wind map. So this is sort of more color coded. There is your Gulf Stream. Notice how the water temperature over New England, say Cape Cod, is much warmer than at the exact same latitude over, say, Portugal or Spain, okay? And here you see the effect of warm, cold water rather, sort of oozing its way down. So you have this blue and green mixing in with this red and orange and yellow. And these are where big storms tend to form. So the Gulf Stream is responsible for keeping the European continent warmer than it would otherwise be. That's the basic takeaway from this slide. These are the climate slides. So basically mostly sea climates. It is a strong ocean moderated climate. Uh, the farther east you go, the drier, colder it is. So that would be these climates here, D. So D climates are considered severe mid latitude climate, whereas C climates are more mild climates. Uh, the further south you go, the more Mediterranean, no big surprise. That's, they take the name from the sea immediately next to him. So think of cities like Barcelona, Rome, Athens. They tend to have a Mediterranean climate. It is a winter wet, summer dry climate. 
So if you go to Barcelona in July, expect no rain. If you go to Rome in July, if you go to Athens in July, it doesn't mean that it can't rain, but it is very, very unlikely to rain. Most of the rain in Mediterranean climates comes in the winter months. Environmental issues. Well, of course, acid rain is not only an issue in Europe or Asia or the United States. It is an issue pretty much in every area of the Northern Hemisphere, especially. And that's because acid rain is an exported problem. And by that, I mean the United States dumps a whole bunch of stuff into the air. Well, that stuff then gets caught in storms and it moves east over Europe, becoming a problem here. Europe does the same and it moves over towards Asia. Asia does the same and it moves over the United States and Canada. And that's a bit of an oversimplification, but what I'm trying to get at is the fact that the winds, the westerly winds, in the Northern Hemisphere is taking some of those chemicals and transporting them along the wind currents, otherwise known as storms, okay? Uh, this is a interesting environmental issue or thing, or I don't know what the right term is, but this is the Global Agricultural Insurance Vault. It is found in the island of uh, Svalbard in the northern, northern Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that's what it looks like. It's basically built into the ground. And as a result, it is inside of permafrost. And basically every country on Earth, including like North Korea, by the way, they've sent boxes and boxes of seeds of plants that grow in their country as a as an insurance should there be some big environmental catastrophe you still maintain a seed catalog for the future so it's kind of interesting norway built it on their own nobody told them to do it they just did it and they told the world here you go store this here Wasn't that nice of them? Renewable energy. So Germany used to be the world's top leading producer of solar panels. They're now number five, not because they've gotten worse, but because others have gotten much better. And Germany is frankly small compared to like the US, India, China. So you, would, oh, you always knew they were gonna go down the rankings. However, uh, they're remarkably good for a country that far north at not only generating electricity, but also producing solar panels, okay? It's not just the Chinese and the United States, Germany and other European powers. So these are the rankings. This is 2016 through 2020, and I've, I didn't include 2019, frankly. Um, but here is how the numbers have changed. So China is number one, and they're likely never to relinquish that as a function of size. The United States at number two, and by the way, there was an increase in solar energy generation or capacity, even through the Trump administration. Many people thought, oh no, it's going to go down. It didn't, and it's not going to. It doesn't really matter who the administration is. Uh, that number is still going to go up because a lot of this happens at the local level. Japan has significantly increased their capacity as a function of getting away from nuclear energy, uh, but look at places, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, and France. So the US has a, the EU rather, has a big combined uh, solar capacity. Think about Germany is roughly the size of New York and New England put together. And here's more on Germany, for example. So, so renewables include solar, wind, offshore and onshore waste, biomass and hydro. And what I mean by waste is um, burning trash, basically, cleanly, believe it or not, and generating electricity that way. So the goal for Germany is 65% renewable energy by 2030. 
they're currently at 46% in 2020. That's pretty impressive. You can see where they've come from 6.3 in the year 2000, all the way to 46 in 20 years. So in another 10, they hope to be at 65%. Now, this isn't perfect. Uh, there are always challenges in doing this, but what they've done over the past two decades is nothing short of remarkable. Some of their impacts, obviously the idea of melting glaciers. A lot of these glaciers, you know, a lot of this is not necessarily an issue in terms of people losing the water that they need for drink and for agriculture because the climate is frankly wet enough to support it on its own, but it's sort of a sign of something else happening, right? Losing glaciers in Asia, losing glaciers in the Andes is a bigger deal because there people rely on that water for their livelihood. Not as much in places like Europe, but still not, in, not insignificant anyway. Uh, these are some of the uh, environmental issues in Europe. So the sea gates of the nether in the Netherlands. So because of climate change and the idea of sea level rise, there is probably no country on earth that is A, more vulnerable, but B, more prepared than the Netherlands. Here's an example of sea gates. The ocean is out there and they are able to swing these gates closed and prevent the North Sea from doing any damage inland. That's pretty impressive. That's engineering, okay? Uh, I want you to take a look at this image for a second. Look at where the trucks and cars are. Look where the water is. Do you see where I'm going with this? These cars are way below the water level. So this is all engineered in such a way that they're protected. They're taking advantage of wind as far as these uh, windmills. And so the Netherlands has to sort of function like this because they are essentially below sea level. A big por portions of their real estate is. So if you're, if you're standing here outside of your vehicle, you're looking up at sea level. These are homes that float. Again, if your house is way down here, you're looking up at the water, which is sort of a weird feeling, I would imagine. I've never been in such a place, but I would imagine looking up at water meaning if you were to go straight without going up in elevation you would be already below the water level <clears throat> but this is one way around that if you make your home sort of anchored so your homes float they don't really flood they're anchored to some sort of walkway and they can go up and down depending on water level clever if you put solar panels on top, you basically kill two birds with one stone. Just curious, would you live like this? I have a feeling most American, most Americans, period, doesn't really matter where you're from, Florida, New York, Texas, California, I don't think most would want to, but the mindset in Europe is different. It's just different. If you are European yourself, or if you know somebody who is, you probably know what I'm talking about. So population and settlement. Um, although the population of Europe is roughly in the 700 million um, range, many places are either have slow or negative rates of natural uh, increase. Some of them are shrinking. And so most of Europe is already what's considered highly urbanized. So here are some of the, num the numbers, the total fertility rates, notice how they're all 
every single one of them below two, every single one. In fact, let me just do a quick, make sure I haven't misspoken. Yep, every single one of them is, and no, notice the countries with a negative rate of natural increase means these countries are actually shrinking other than migration. If they have migration coming in, that can make up for the loss of the native population. So whether it's Western, Central, Northern, Southeastern, Southern Europe, or any of the micro states, they're all pretty much at really, really low fertility. So think about this for a second. Fertility is one of the best indicators of development. The more developed a country or a region is, the bigger a portion of their workforce that women will comprise. And if that's the case, women often either forego or limit how many kids they have. It's just one of those things. So the more developed a place is, the fewer children they tend to have because kids are no longer advantageous economically. You're not, you don't have a farm that you're gonna to have to sort of like, um, you know, man with people, meaning your kids, like in the distant past. And kids are expensive. And because people live in cities more than before, look at these percentage urban, they tend to move away from rural regions into cities and therefore have fewer kids because it's expensive to have them. So it's an interesting, anyway, discussion to have. So let's look at some population pyramids. Look at Germany, fertility rate of 1.4. They have their own baby boom post-World War II, and that has significantly changed. They've somewhat stabilized over the past 15 years or so. Italy, 1.5, same basic pattern. Uh, Iceland, on the other hand, is still probably one of the higher population changes, but Iceland itself, I mean, think about it. Iceland, that big island of Iceland only has about 360,000 people, that's it. I mean, Newark, New Jersey, Newburgh, New York has more than that. So it might be a big, big place, but the population itself is pretty, uh, pretty small. Although in terms of fertility rate, as it states here, it has the highest fertility in all of Europe. Amazingly enough, maybe isolation from the rest of the mainland has something to do with that. Here's Spain. 1.25, huge generational shift that took place about two generations ago. I mean, huge. They went from a stage two country to a stage five in the span of about 30 to 40 years. So there are some pro-growth policies and there are some measures that have happened. I mean, I think countries realize you can't get too small too quick that has a concern as a function of labor shortages, declining tax revenue, social services that are needed. Um, it's, it's a big deal. It is definitely a big deal to, to shrink too quickly. You sort of want to be in that 2 to 2.5 total fertility rate. And clearly, there is not a single European country there now. Okay. Migration, there is migration within Europe and to Europe. Uh, there for economic reasons and refugees within Europe and legal and illegal and former colonies outside of Europe. So think about what happened in 2015, 2016, 2017 from places like Syria or former colonial states like Algeria and Libya and Tunisia, okay? Um, you know, Brexit, Brexit became final on December 31st, 2020. 
So for example, the idea of the European Union, not breaking up, but definitely changing. So look at that. We'll look at places. This is one of the first times, frankly, that we begin to discuss the idea of primate cities. And here you're looking at one, Paris, France. And it may not mean as much in Europe, but it will mean more in other places. So let's define it. A primate city is a city that is twice as big as the next biggest city in that country. And usually that city has significance. When you think of France, you think of Paris, right? You may not think of Toulouse or Nice or, um, oh, let's think of other French cities like Bordeaux. You may, you know, if you're a wine enthusiast, maybe you think of champagne, uh, but if you're just generic human out there, when you hear France, you think of Paris. It is the cultural and economic center of that place, period. You think of high fashion, you know, Cartier, Dior, Hermes, uh, perfumes, food, Anything that is sort of culturally significant in terms of French, you think of Paris. So can't get away from that. Uh, well, the, the idea of the difference between Eastern and Western places in Europe, geopolitical change. So think about all these wars that took place, the birth of the European Union, the rise and fall of Germany twice, the rise and fall of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, which followed the breakup of the Soviet Union. So lots of political change, lots and lots of it. And so this is, you know, pre-World War I, such a thing as a Russian Empire, a German Empire. Post-World War I, post-World War II, so this is the birth of the Cold War, which made the world a very sort of bipolar. There was the East and the West, and we were the West, the United States by and large, and Russia was, or the Soviet Union was the East. And we had our allies and they had theirs. It was frankly a, frankly a simpler world. I know it's hard for you to realize that because you didn't live in that world, but from somebody who lived at the end of that world, it was frankly simpler than what we have now, which is my opinion. And of course, post-Soviet Union. So notice, Soviet Union. Oh, now you have Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. And there's that sort of, that, uneasy wall it's not really a wall anymore you can you know they're, they're they're their own countries but they definitely have ties to russia there's no getting around that and yugoslavia oh slovenia Croatia, bosnia serbia kosovo montenegro albania macedonia big changes big changes All right, let's look at some of the idea of cities. So this is Western Europe, compact, high density, taller buildings. Eastern Europe, oh, different, because Eastern European cities form, not form, but reformed after the horrors of World War II in a more Soviet or under a Soviet lens, whereas Western European cities did not. Okay, so uh, the Brandenburg Gate and Wall. So I love this image, love it. It's one of my favorite images ever. Uh, it shows the Brandenburg Gate uh, when Nazi Germany controlled it. By the way, the Nazi symbol stolen from Asia. Uh, so you see this in many Asian statues and it has nothing to do with Nazi Germany in any event. Here is Hitler during one of his parades going through the Brandenburg Gate. And then this is, of course, the way it looks now. It survived that war. 
And I love this image because there's a sort of an LED flag of Israel being sort of showcased on it, which is amazing. And of course, the Union Jack also showcased on it. So contrast, change, nothing static. Even LGBT, the rainbow flag. So this, this, and this, had Hitler seen any of that, although he wouldn't have understood what this meant anyway, um, it just would have been crazy, right? So this is the Berlin Wall. This is that Brandenburg Gate. That's this. Notice the horses on top. It's a here's the the wall that Ronald Reagan famously asked the, the Soviet premier to take it down back in 1987 in a famous speech in Germany. Languages, there are so many. So of course there are romantic languages like Spanish and Portuguese and Catalan and Italian and French um, and Galician and Scandinavian. And I've been to Barcelona and I speak fluent Spanish. I could barely understand Catalan, could barely understand it. I can understand Spanish and Galician I can understand a little bit better. It's easier, it's closer to Spanish to me. But then you move into places where you have the Germanic languages and where you tend to have the Baltic, uh, Celtic, all the different languages that are spoken, either non-Indo-European languages and Indo-European languages. And no, 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 notice, so if English, what we speak, we speak American English, but if you want to think of just generic English, it is a Germanic language. So it has associations with Dutch and Flemish and Swedish and Danish and Icelandic and Norwegian, even though these languages seem so super complicated to me. Um, English sort of comes from that. Um, maybe more old English, it sounds like a lot of these other languages. Oh, and notice how Finnish part of Scandinavia is not really similar to these other languages. So they're separate because Finnish is closer to Russian because they used to be part of Russia, what we call Russia nowadays, the, the, the principality of it. So a remarkable, remarkable um, map and patchwork of languages. I love Greek. I love listening to Greek and I love reading it, even though I can't read it. It's to me, it's so many math symbols. When I when I see Greek, I see mathematics. I see calculus. So to them, it's just letters. To me, it's math symbols. Uh, but there you see the difference again between, you know, what the, 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 the similarities and the differences between the Greeks and the Turks. Um, they share a border, and there's a lot of difference and a lot of similarity. Religious domains, Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, you see this in the map of the United States. Wherever you see areas that are Roman Catholic, they were either settled by the Spanish, by the French, or by Italians and Irish. Wherever you see predominant Protestantism, you find places that were settled by Germans, the uh, English, United Kingdom, Brits, UK, whatever you want to call it, or places that were settled by Scandinavians, Norway, Sweden. That would be like uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska. And in the map of the United States, you see how a place like the state of Texas goes from English names to Spanish names like El Paso, Amarillo, San Antonio. And then you get into places like Santa Fe, Las Cruces, um, California, 
Sacramento, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco. These are all Spanish names. These are all Catholic in their origin. So it makes a big, big difference. Or if you go to a place like New England, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. And all the names there are from cities like, you know, Plymouth and Southampton and uh, Norwich and Ply uh, I already mentioned Plymouth, um, Providence, um, East Hampton, New London, places like that. So it all sort of transported away from their or area of origin into what we call the United States now, all right? So that's where I'm gonna end it for the lesson. Um, again, you know, there's more to this slide packet, so make sure you go over it on your own, but I wanted to hit the topics, the main topics. Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating region, very complicated, very diverse, very diverse actually. Uh, and it basically forms the exit points for many of the areas that we called home nowadays, whether that be Canada, or the United States, Mexico, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. They were all almost entirely settled by Europeans. And again, whatever your opinion of colonialization may be, the fact that it happened, it happened. And it's led to a whole bunch of other cultural, ethnic, religious, language, landscapes that are here and are not gonna go away. And so it's, it's, it's good to understand why. Uh, and in those videos for languages and accents, you see that in there as well. So anyway, uh hope you have a fantastic week if you have any questions let me know or come to the lesson uh live office hour rather if the time schedule doesn't work let me know and i can set one up for you that matches both our schedules regardless hope you're doing well and we'll talk to you soon bye <laughs>